Conversation with the Candidate continues. Welcome back to Conversation with the Candidate and tonight's guest, former HUD Secretary Julian Castro. We're going to have questions now from our New Hampshire voters in a town hall format. I'll jump in with a social media question now and then and a follow up. But for now, let's get right to the questions and we'll start with Gary Evans of where. Hi, welcome to New Hampshire. Well, as you know, we've uh, we just had another mass shooting with an AR-15 assault rifle. I think everybody but the NRA thinks that we need some better gun control. I'd like to know what exactly your policies would be if you became president. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, for the question. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we marked 20 years since Columbine. And if folks will remember, when Columbine happened in 1999, it was uh, an absolute shock to our country. And one of the saddest things about living in these times is that it seems oftentimes that we've gotten so used to hearing the news about another mass shooting. And it's time for us in this country to take serious action to help ensure that that does not happen the way that it is today. I support common sense gun reform. I support universal background checks, uh, limiting the capacity of magazines, and also uh, an updated assault weapons ban. Uh, I believe that all of those things make sense, that they will help prevent the kind of carnage that we've seen across the country too many times. Uh, and one of the most, I think, shameful moments of the United States Congress in the last few years was after Newtown happened and that uh, those congressional representatives, even though 90% of Americans supported something as simple as universal background checks, and I want to point out, mostly Republican congressional representatives. There were some, a few Democrats, but mostly Republican congressional representatives did not even support universal background checks. We need to change that. And I will tell you that I have been absolutely inspired by the kids at Parkland, uh, these young people who have spoken for their generation, become activists. And we haven't seen a lot of legisl legislative changes yet, but this is what has changed that's important. Um, what has changed is that there are more elected officials, more politicians who are willing to stand up to the NRA and to push back. And I'm confident that in the years to come that we can pass common sense gun reform. The last thing I'll say about this is that I believe that we need to connect the dots and that um, go beyond this issue of only what happens in one of these mass shootings. For instance, um, many people who die at the hands of a gun, uh, actually die by suicide. They take their own life with a gun. And this connects directly to our conversation about health care, making sure that we no longer separate mental health care from physical health care. Because too often times, people live with this stigma, if they have bipolar disorder, if they have depression, that leads them down further and further into this abyss, and they commit something like suicide. Uh, I want to make sure that we connect those dots and invest in things like mental health care that I believe will also reduce death by guns. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Next question comes from Ann Ackerman. Hi, thank you for um, being with us today. How would you address runaway prescription drug prices? Thank you very much. Uh, and for the question, uh, I, I believe that we need a new health care system. Uh, I grew up with a grandmother who had diabetes, and my brother Joaquin and I watched uh, as we got older and she got older, uh, we watched her condition get worse and worse until right before she passed away in early 1996, she had to have one of her feet amputated, which is very common for people with severe diabetes. She had type 2 diabetes. That whole time, though, she had Medicare. I want to strengthen Medicare for the people who are on it who have it, and then make sure that everybody can have access to Medicare if they want it. As part of that, I believe that we should do things like ensure that the government can negotiate drug prices, right? and that we're able to um, lower prescription drug costs because of that. Uh, there are too many people up here in New Hampshire, for instance, or in my neck of the woods of Texas, up here in New Hampshire who have to go to Canada to get cheap, cheaper drugs, or in Texas they go to Mexico, that should never be the case in the United States. And I will support all efforts, all legislation, 
uh, to ensure that we can bring down that cost. But ultimately, we need to change our healthcare system to one where health care and medication is available to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. We have a social media question coming in from Stephen Kidder of Concord. He asks, with 11 million undocumented people in this country, will you commit to actively securing a path to citizenship for aspiring citizens? Thanks for the question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stephen. Um, actually, yes, I will. Um, let me just tell folks how I think about this, right? because this is, this is important, uh, both as a matter of the future of our country, but because this president has clearly made this his front and center issue. Right. Uh, on April 2nd, I released what I call a people first immigration plan. And I have a completely different vision for immigration policy from this president. Uh, he and I agree that we need a secure border. Every country in the world, of course, is always going to be concerned about making sure that its border is secure. I believe that we actually have a border that is more secure than it's ever been. We have 654 miles of fencing. We have thousands of personnel on the border. We have guns, we have boats, we have helicopters, we have airplanes, we have security cameras. Let's not confuse the fact that so many people are coming to our border with the idea that we don't have a secure border. And in fact, we can make sure that we further secure the border by investing, for instance, at our ports of entry so that we better catch uh, human trafficking and drug trafficking. However, this president wants us to think that we have to choose between having a secure border and being compassionate. I believe that we can have a secure border and also be compassionate. And I'm asking people to choose compassion instead of cruelty. I would stop separating little children from their mothers. I would end family detention. And I would create a path to citizenship for the 10 to 11 undocumented million undocumented immigrants who are here as long as they haven't committed a serious crime. That would include dreamers, but it would also include their parents and other undocumented immigrants. And uh, I also believe that we have to get smart about what to do on this in the long run. I've called for a 21st century Marshall Plan for Central America. A lot of these folks are coming from uh, Honduras or El Salvador, or Guatemala. And why would a mother take her six-month-old infant thousands of miles on a dangerous journey, except that it's so dangerous there where she's at that she has to get away, get out of it, get to the hope of a better life in the United States? We can partner with these countries in an unprecedented way to make sure that people can find safety and opportunity there instead of having to come and knock on the door of the United States. That's what I believe in. And so it's a smarter bolder and more compassionate but effective immigration policy that I've proposed. Okay, next question comes from Joan Wentworth of Lineborough. Good evening, Secretary Castro. Good evening. Could you give us your thoughts on the types of circumstances where the President should or should not issue an executive order? And as President, would you support setting limits on their use? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, yeah, so uh, of course I do believe that there's uh, under our Constitution, a check on executive authority. Uh, I certainly don't agree with presidents who have done things that uh, have plainly been illegal. A good example of that was uh, in the 1970s, uh, the actions of Richard Nixon. Uh, I also believe that uh, uh, the push by this president to take money from other parts of the budget summarily out of the hands of Congress to build the wall that he wants to build was also stepping over the bounds. At the same time, um, I would be comfortable uh, doing executive orders that are in the tradition of what other presidents have done. Let me give you an example of that. A few, year, few years ago, when uh, President Obama dealt with this decision about whether to do DACA or not, and then after that, DAPA, um, prioritizing uh, how we would enforce immigration was within the realm of what other presidents had done in the past, George H.W. Bush and other presidents. And so I would look to the guidance of what, of precedent, of what other presidents have done and determine whether or not an executive order would be appropriate. Uh, I would not use executive orders uh, just because 
we can't get something done in Congress. I believe in the system that we have. At the same time, I would use executive orders that, is, that are in the tradition of what presidents have done before, where I see an opportunity to make important change. The thing is, though, we know that if we want to change our health care system in a meaningful way, we can't do that by executive order. We're going to have to do that through the will of the people as expressed by Congress. Right? If we want something like universal pre-K, which I have advocated for, you know, we're not going to do that unless we actually have the support of the United States Congress. And in that, there's actually a challenge to the American people right, to get out there and participate at the local level, at the federal level in these congressional elections and make a difference. It also, though, points to another point I would make, which is uh, we need to completely change the way that redistricting, that the drawing up of these lines is done in this country. I support legislation that's in the Congress right now to go to an independent or commission style of redistricting so that the politicians are not choosing their people, the people are choosing their politicians. Because part of the problem and part of the reason that presidents have used executive orders more and more over these last few years is because things are so polarized because these districts are gerrymandered that politicians don't have to speak to the other side. We need to change that to reduce the polarization and get things more in balance so that Congress is able to get things done and presidents will feel less pressure uh, to use executive orders instead of going through Congress. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for the question. Another social media question coming in, this one from Scott Hatch. He says, as the national debt exceeds $22 trillion and candidates are offering more social programs, how would you meet current fiscal demands while reducing the debt? That's a great, great question, and I get asked that question a lot. Um, I believe that we need to be fiscally responsible. Uh, number one, uh, we need to garner more revenue, take in more revenue, right? Uh, and we also need to ensure that we're controlling spending. On the spending side, uh, I would subject every single department of the federal government to rigorous scrutiny in terms of our spending, including the Department of Defense. There are different ways, I believe, that we can achieve cost savings. Um, on the revenue side, what's happened in this country is that over the last 40 years, we've been asking more and more from the middle class and from the working poor, and less and less from people at the very top and big corporations. Y'all may have seen, for instance, a few weeks ago it was reported that uh, Amazon made more than $11 billion last year, but Amazon didn't pay any federal tax. There were 60 American companies that were recently cited, well-known companies, big companies, that also were profitable and didn't pay any federal tax. In fact, some of them had a negative tax liability because of the tax code. How does that happen that you and families out there are paying more federal tax than Amazon because our tax code has gone in the wrong direction. So to answer your question, I would not only um, be rigorous on the spending side, I would also ensure that we draw more revenue to be able to pay for a 21st century safety net, universal health care, universal pre-K for three and four year olds, higher education, that 21st century safety net that can ensure that all Americans can prosper. Can you point to something you did as the HUD secretary to save money? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, President Obama charged us with doing uh, in the federal government was going through our, our regulations and getting rid of those regulations that were overly burdensome and some that didn't make sense. And as part of that, um, you know, we were able to streamline HUD's uh, administration and to save money in the process. Next question comes from Lynn Healy. Good evening. Hello. Um, my question is two parts. I first am interested in your vision um, for the United States on the world stage. And the second part is who do you have advising you and working with you on this issue? Yeah. Thank you very much for the question, Lynn. Uh, <laughs> where do I start here <laughs> with the, uh, what this president has done uh, to the reputation and I believe to the strength of the United States around the world. First of all, I believe that we have the greatest nation on earth. Uh, and as Americans, when we walk around the world in different countries, there is, a, there is still uh, a respect that people have because you're an American and it means something. 
right? It always should mean something. I believe that we have a role to play in leading on those values that have made this nation great and that we know are important for other countries around the world. Freedom, democracy, and opportunity. That doesn't mean that we get engaged in unnecessary or ill-advised conflicts. We saw the mistake of Iraq. Right? I believe that we need to be thoughtful before we ever go into any kind of military conflict. We also need to make sure that if we ever decide to do that, that we summon our allies to be a part of it. We also need to be thoughtful about if we ever withdraw from those conflicts. One difference that I have with this president is that even though I agree that, and many people agree, that we need to withdraw from places like Afghanistan and Syria, this president announced it one day over Twitter without properly consulting the military, our military, or our allies. We need to be thoughtful and more careful than that, and I would be. I would also, as a first order of business, repair the damage that this president has done with our allies around the world our closest allies, the UK, Germany, uh, France, and also institutions like NATO that have helped keep us safer and have helped us prosper in the 20th and 21st century. And finally, I would strike up new partnerships. Uh, for instance, in Mexico and Latin America, there was a big payoff militarily or keeping us safe and also economically over the years uh, with the relationships that we forged post-World War II in Europe. Though, those have been great for the United States. But we have never taken as seriously our neighbors to the South. And it's important that we do that more than ever, not only on this issue of immigration, but also because you have countries like China that are going around the world to Latin America and to Africa and forging their own relationships. It's estimated that in 2030, China is supposed to eclipse the United States and become the largest economy in the world. We need to forge partnerships now more than ever. And I'm be I believe that I could play a unique role as the next president in forging those kinds of relationships with our neighbors to the South. Uh, finally, uh, as to your other question, uh, during the vice presidential selection process that I was a part of and during this presidential campaign, I have a number of people that we're consulting on foreign policy that are at, that range from um, people at universities to think tanks to people who have served uh, our nation before, and uh, I continue to take their advice, uh, get their input, and also read. <laughs> right, read up on the actual policy. People still do that, uh, and it's important that we do that uh, because, uh, you know, my service has been in domestic policy. Right? So I want to make sure that I do everything that I can to be prepared to understand well. Uh, the fullness of these issues, and that's what I've been doing. Thank, Thank you. you. And we've got about 30 seconds. Secretary, I'm just curious. You're an identical twin. Mm -hmm. Would they have to give uh, Secret Service protection to your brother as well if you're the president? Well, you know, he's a little bit uglier than I am, so they could probably <laughs> tell us apart, you know. Uh, actually, they already do that. They actually, the Secret Service gives protection to usually the family members, the immediate family members of a president. Uh, and I, I think also the vice president. So uh, the answer to that is yes. Be safe. Right? Yeah. For now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to continue this conversation online and on our mobile app. But for now, for TV, we uh, thank you, Secretary Castro, thank for you. being here for conversation with the candidate on television. Next week, we'll have Senator Amy Klobuchar. You can join us next Thursday for that one. But again, join us online and on our mobile app where we will continue this conversation with Julian Castro. Thanks for joining us tonight.